Minister Thomas Blomkist, honored speakers, national experts, youth delegates and participants, welcome. Welcome to our webinar titled, See, Listen and Include, Participation for Children and Youth with Disabilities in the Nordic Region. We are so excited to see such interest in this webinar. I've been told that we have 230 participants registered. Today's webinar will explore the universal right of all children and young people to participate, to express their views, and to be heard in all matters concerning them, a right that is entrenched in both the Convention on the Rights of the Child as well as the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. My name is Charlotte McLean in Tlapo, and I'm the Global Disability Advisor at the World Bank Group. I am delighted to be part of this event. My role today is to assist in guiding the webinar throughout the day. And I must say, I am deeply honored to have been asked to moderate this session on topics that I'm very passionate about, but also most appropriately, today significance is that it is Nordic Day. And I wanted to recognize that. About four years ago, I was invited by Maria Montefusco to Stockholm as a speaker to a similar event organized by the Nordic Welfare Center. So it really feels great to be back, even though this time it's a bit different. Last time I joined as, as a speaker and today I join as a moderator. And this time I'm not in Stockholm, I'm joining you virtually, but we're all here and that's what's important. On behalf of today's host, the Nordic Welfare Center, I would like to extend a deep appreciation for joining us today. As many of you well know, the Nordic Welfare Center is an institution under the Nordic Council of Ministers. Their mandate is to contribute to increased cooperation and knowledge in the Nordic region relating to important welfare issues. One of the most important issues is the one that we will be discussing here today, and it's related to the health and welfare of the child. Today's webinar is an important event for the Nordic Welfare Center, as it marks the end of a two, year, two and a half year project on the, right of all young, uh, on the right of all children and young people with disabilities in Nordic countries uh, in terms of their right to participate. And today's work, we're able to culminate in a launch, the launch of the report, See, Listen and Include, Participation of Children and Youth with Disabilities in Nordic Countries. The report in this webinar are project activities within the Nordic Council of Ministers Action Plan on disability for the period of 2018 through 2022. This plan is a plan that's dedicated to reinforcing knowledge and dialogue, as we're doing today, on human rights and the rights of persons with disabilities in the Nordic region and internationally. Throughout the day, you will be introduced to an excellent set of speakers from the Nordic countries, and they will share with you knowledge from their lines of work to help us understand better the opportunities for more children and youth with disabilities to participate. And so with that, let's get started. And I'd like to hand over to Minister Thomas Blunkist for his remarks. Over to you. Dear participants, colleagues and friends, uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to take part in this very topical discussion on the participation of children and young people with, dis with disabilities in the Nordic region. Let me start with a short reflection on the current situation. While the inclusion of children and young people is always crucial as we strive to build sustainable societies. I would argue, argue that the present pandemic has underlined uh, this aspect even further. In balancing the restrictive measures, we must ensure that the negative consequences 
uh, on children and young are as limited as possible. We also need to find alternative ways of supporting uh, active engagement and inclusion during these difficult times, as different forms of social exclusion in young, young age can have long-standing negative consequences. Now, before continuing on the theme of children and the youth, allow me to say a few general words about, words about Nordic cooperation. Currently, Finland holds the rotating presidency of the Nordic Council of Ministers. The broad aim of the cooperation was defined in, the, in a joint vision by the Nordic Prime Ministers in, some, in the summer of 2019. The Nordics are to become the world's most sustainable and integrated region by 2030. Accordingly, the cooperation focuses on three main work strands a green, competitive and socially sustainable region. In more concrete terms, and to name just a few examples, this entails actions and initiatives such as supporting climate-friendly and environmentally sound solutions, free movement and mobility, joint Nordic international profiling, and many types of cultural, educational and civil society exchange. That said, said, I'm fully aware of the challenge that the pandemic has posed also to our Nordic cooperation, not least when it comes to traditionally open borders and free movement. Finland, as the current chair, is committed to exploring ways of further enhancing the exchange of information, coordination and collaboration as we consider our crisis response now and in the future. Dear friends, let me get back to the actual topic of today, the inclusion of children and young people. I will approach this, the issue from two much mutually supportive angels, the Finnish policy framework and the Nordic cooperation perspective. The point of departure must be that all children and young people uh, are important here and now. The, as the decision makers, our thinking should be guided more by the principle of together with rather than working for. for. Every child and young person has the right to be heard and the right to meaningful inclusion. The Finnish government program points the di direction very clearly. The stated objective is to increase inclusion among young people. Moreover, the obligation to consult young people is to be re reinforced. As a tool to implement uh, these objectives, every four years the government adapts a cross-sectoral national youth work and youth policy program underscoring the means to support equal opportunities, skills and ways to participate, as well as incorporating the youth perspective uh, as part of public sector decision making, are all examples of measures that focus on the twin goals of prevention and social exclusion and enhancing inclusion and involvement. In the Nordic Council, Council of Ministers, the child and youth perspective is a cross-cutting theme that we try to mainstream in all our work. For one part, we emphasize child and youth participation in our projects. We invite young representatives to take a seat in our committees and advisory body, bodies and we have specific funding schemes to allocate resources to child and youth organizations. And in addition, the Councils of Ministers staff is provided training on children's rights, while specific guidelines support all these actions. Friends, my concluding remark would be that all my previous comments are perhaps even more relevant with respect to children and young people with disabilities. 
as these persons might need additional and specifically designed support to secure their right to participation and inclusion. I recall a saying that the level of society's sorry, civilization can be measured from the way it treats its most vulnerable groups. This should always be our yardstick. Thank you, and I wish you a very interesting Nordens Dark. Thank you very much, Minister Blumkist, for, for your words and um, for emphasizing the point of departure that all children are important now and in the future. And I think for making it very clear that there's a very strong commitment to reinforce the obligation to ensure that children are included and that they can participate. And also thank you very much for talking a bit about the impact of the, the pandemic as it relates to children. So thank you so much for getting us um, off to a good start. And um, I would like to quickly now move to the next speaker. And the next speaker is um, Professor um, Kirsten S uh, Sandberg. And she will speak about how Article 12 in the Convention on the Rights of the Child and Article 7 in the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities are intertwined. She's a professor of law at the law faculty at the University, University of Oslo. So over to you, Professor. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for inviting me to this exciting event. I'm really happy to be part of it. It's, it's so important to, to lift these issues. I'll now try to share my screen. So let's see. Yes, I hope you can now see my screen. Yes, that's good. So you already mentioned the title. So this is about participation of, of children, of all children, as has been mentioned before. And it's about children's right to be heard, it's often called, or children's right to express their views. And I will look more closely at, at this topic from the point of view of the two conventions and those articles that are mentioned. Article 12 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child and Article 7 of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, so Article 12 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, it, it uh, gives the child a right to express views and to be heard. And as a lawyer, I always think it's important to actually see the text of the convention. It says in number one that states parties shall assure to the child who's capable of forming his or her own views, the right to express those views freely in all matters affecting the child, the views of the child being given due weight in accordance with the age and maturity of the child. Um, in, in its second paragraph, it says that for this purpose, the child shall in particular be provided the opportunity to be heard in any judicial and administrative proceedings affecting the child, either directly or through a representative or an appropriate body, in a manner consistent with the procedural rules of national law. So we can see that this first part of the article is the more general uh, part on, on all children's right to express views in all matters. And then the second one is more on, on judicial and administrative proceedings. Uh, so that is more to the cases that children might be involved in. Um, in Article 7 uh, on the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, art, um, it, it runs like this. It's number three that talks about the, the right to express their views. States parties shall ensure to children no, that children with disabilities have the right to express their views freely on all matters affecting them, their views being given due weight in accordance with their age and maturity on an equal basis with other children and to be provided with disability and age appropriate uh, assistance to realize that right. So we can see that Article 7 uh, of the CRPD and Article 12 of the CRC are not at all in contradiction with each other. It's 
uh, they form uh, or they work in, in synergy. They, they just uh, reinforce each other, which is really a good thing. With the addition of, of the um, disability and age appropriate assistance to be able to realize this right on an equal basis. But this is also part of the interpretation of, of the CRC, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, Article 12. Um, there are some general comments that have been uh, produced by the committees. Um, the, com the Committee on the Rights of the Child um, has a general comment number 12 of 2009 on the right of the child to be heard. Uh, it also has general comment number nine of 2020, now 2007, on the rights of children with disabilities. The CRPD committee has no general comment on this topic specifically, but there are some indications in other general comments. Uh, for instance, general comment number 14 of 2016 on the right to inclusive education. So what I will say uh, in the continuing <coughs> speech uh, is based on these general comments. But I will also, towards the end, mention the concluding observations from these two committees to the Nordic countries. So first, what is participation? It's defined in general comments number 12 by the CRC committee as ongoing processes which include information sharing and dialogue between children and adults based on mutual respect and in which children can learn how their views and those of adults are taken into account and shape the outcome of such processes. I think that's so well formulated that I wanted to, to show you the whole sentence because it's about information sharing, but also dialogue, and it should be based on mutual respect between adults and children, not um, from the ups uh, to, to the down, um, to put it that way. Um, or children, no, adults in the upper position and children down here. And, and this is not the way it should be today. It should be based on mutual respect. And also to for children to learn how their views and those of adults are taken into account. And this is where I think we still have a long way to go in, in also in the Nordic countries. Children's views are heard, but they are not necessarily taken into account. But it's not real participation until children can actually feel that their views are taken into account. Uh, further, the same general comment says that the concept of participation emphasizes that included chil including children should not only be a momentary act, but the starting point for an intense exchange between children and adults on the de development of policies, programs and measures in all relevant contexts of children's lives. And um, this is also important to, to note that it should be, as it said here, an intense exchange. So all of this, the participation of children should be a process. It's not a one-off thing that you can just tick the box. Children have been heard, that's okay. It should be a continuous process. Um, you may say that there are two types of participation. Um, there is the democratic type of uh, participation where children should be heard as a group, um, children, all children in a country, for instance, or a group of children that would be in the family, at school, in the local community, in the national society, or even internationally. Um, and children with disabilities could be then the group of children that should be heard if they have some common views to share with, with everybody else. But it could also be groups of children with disabilities because they may have many different views and, and interests. Um, this democratic kind of participation is more politically oriented and it's closely linked to the freedom of speech. Uh, general comment number nine of, of the CRC committee, that is the one on children with disabilities, encourages representation of children with disabilities in various bodies, such as parliament, committees and other forums to improve policies and for inclusion of children with disabilities. But I, I think, again, it should be noticed, it's, it's not only for inclusion, which is important as an aim, of itself, but including children and having children participate in processes um, relating to policy making will also improve the policies. And that is maybe the most important thing. Um, 
The other type of participation is that children have the right to be heard in individual matters. You might say this is a more legally oriented type of participation. It has to do with being heard in court or for before administrative bodies, but not necessarily like this. Uh, it has to do with any everyday matter affecting the child in the family, at school, etc. But this is about the individual child. And both of them are, I mean, both types are covered by the right to participation. So who has the right to express views? Well, all children have the right to express views. And the need for accommodation or for having some kind of assistance in, in expressing their views does definitely not deprive children of that right. Sometimes in practice, it may seem to be that way. So that's why it's so important to, to emphasize this point. Article 7 of the CRPD says that children with disabilities have the right to express their views so no limitation is about all children with disabilities and to be provided with disability and age appropriate assistance to realize that right. Uh, the CRC says that the children who have the right to express views are any child capable of forming his or her own views. But the Committee on the Rights of the Child has said that this is no, doesn't really represent the limitation because children may, from the very early beginning of their life, they may have a view on anything that, that has to do with themselves, but they express it differently when they are ex very, very small. Um, in, in general comment number 12, the committee also says that states parties are also under the obligation to ensure the implementation of this right for children experiencing difficulties in making their views heard. Children with disabilities should be equipped with and enabled to use any mode of communication necessary to facilitate the expression of their views. So we see that Article 7 of the CRPD uh, directly says or expressly states that children have to be provided with disability and age appropriate assistance to realize their right. Um, and, and the Committee on the Rights of the Child say that children should have any, will be provided with and enabled to use any mode of communication necessary to facilitate the expression of their views. So they are very much in line and they really underline the need for reasonable accommodations so that children with disabilities can actually express their views. It may be about having personal assistance. It may be about interpretation. It could be sign interpretation or other types of interpretation. Uh, and not least uh, in today's society, technical equipment that may make it easier and, and all sorts of other possibilities that will actually support the child in making his or her views heard. And for this uh, purpose, adults need training. And this is not only about children with disabilities. Adults need training in order to hear children and have them participate in a proper way. Uh, whatever child it is about. So you could say uh, the children with a disability has some uh, personal characteristics that makes it important to, to train adults maybe in a specific way, but other children may have some other characteristics that, children, that adults should be aware of when they hear children. So the difference is not so great. You always need to, to accommodate this to the, the child, the individual child or the group of children in question. So this is really an important part, a crucial part of the right to be heard. Um, so in what matters do children have the right to uh, express their views? Article 12 says they have the right in all matters affecting the child and Article 7 of the CRPD says all matters affecting them. So it's the same thing. The two articles have no list of matters. So it's not limited to certain questions. And this is also a very important. General comment number 12 says that a wide interpretation, this is the CRC committee, but it would be the same for, for the CRPD. A wide interpretation is preferable in order to include children in social processes. So you shouldn't limit this to certain issues. And it's definitely not only about matters that have child in the name. It could be about curricula at school or special education. It could be about health issues, 
but also transportation, uh, social protection, climate issues, local planning. Well, I already said climate, environmental issues in general. So children have the right to express their views on all of these matters because they affect them. It could be in kindergarten, at schools, uh, in the community and in the society as well, broader society. Um, it also applies to cultural and le leisure time activities. Uh, and I'll say a little more about education, healthcare and play on the next slides because they are spe specifically mentioned in the general comments. So first to education. General comment number 14 of the CRPD committee says, guaranteeing the right of children to participate in their education must be applied equally to children with disabilities in their own learning and individualized education plan within the classroom pedagogy, through school councils, in the development of school policies and systems, and in the de development of the wider educational policy. So you can see that they start with, with the individual, their own learning uh, education plans, and then the classroom, then the school and the school councils, and then school policies, and even the wider educational policy. So children with disabilities should have this possibility to participate in all of these uh, areas. And the committee stresses that inclusive education provides students with disabilities, in particular those with psychosocial or intellectual impairments, with an opportunity to express their will and preferences. And those two groups are mentioned particularly because they are often forgotten or adults tend somehow to think that they don't have views uh, for some reason, which is of course not true. In healthcare, general comment number 12 uh, of the CRC committee says that children should be included in decision making processes in a manner consistent with their evolving capacities. They should be provided with information about proposed treatments and their effects and outcomes, including in formats appropriate and accessible to children with disabilities. So this is about inclusion of children in healthcare. Um, um, affecting themselves and then particularly on the right to information which also needs to be given in a format which is appropriate and accessible to a child with disabilities. In play and recreation, uh, general comment number 12 says that children who are able to express their views should be consulted regarding the accessibility and appropriateness of play and recreation facilities. Very young children and some children with disabilities who are unable to participate in formal consultative processes should be provided with particular opp opportunities to express their wishes. So this shows us all the time that adults uh, have to be aware, and, and this is any adult that has to do with a child in all of these various uh, areas, uh, but there is a, spe a specific obligation on the government and on public authorities in general to be aware that children with disabilities may need particular opportunities to be able to express their views, and, and they should not be cut out or, or forgotten in these kinds of, of consultative processes. So how can children express their views? And this is a kind of a general question to ask. How can children express their views? Do they have to do it in the same way as adults? No, they can do it in whatever way they like. They can do it orally. They can do it in writing, using photos, film, music, poetry, drawings, theater, whatever they like. Through what channels? They can use any channel they like. Social media, if that's available, or and accessible, uh, newspapers, magazines, radio, TV, letters, email, meetings, even conferences, if the conferences are kind of adapted to uh, a child's possibility to, to speak out, which, I mean, at conferences are often adult arenas, but they may also be accommodated uh, so that children can express their views, which may often be useful in, in adult settings too, that they get children to, to speak about their experiences and their views so that adults can listen. Um, the child, uh, no, there's no need for a child to do it in the adult way. Adults must accept various forms of, of children expressing their views. Uh, so it's up to the child to choose the, the media or the way the child wants to express his or her views. 
a child with a disability may need accommodation, as I said before, and this has to be adjusted to the individual child. So it's the child's wishes of how to, to speak out and also what the child needs, uh, what kinds of assistance or um, technical equipment or whatever the child might need in order to express his or her views. Um, informal decision making. Um, one should listen to the child's views when it comes to deciding how he or she wants to be heard. Um, does the child want to be in a meeting directly with the adults, maybe even in a courtroom? An older child might want to do that. Or does the child want to be uh, to speak to a representative that could then uh, bring the child's views to the body that's going to be, be decided? Uh, to decide the, the matter. So um, it could be either directly by the decision making body or through a representative, but children should actually be allowed to express their views or ask to express their views on how they would like to, to do this in advance of this more formal meeting. Um, then, not least important, I mentioned it uh, just briefly before, the right of the child to information. I mentioned it in relation to, to um, health care, but it's, of course, a general right of the child. It's not in, in, the, in the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, I don't think it's in, in, the Conven oh, in Article 7 of the Rights uh, of Persons with uh, Disabilities. Um, but anyway, it is a right that lies underneath the right to express views because without uh, information the child is not able to know what it may have views on it needs to know what the matter is about and get information to to uh, so that it can actually know what to talk about um, so the child needs um, information in advance about the issue um, at stake and also about the process of being heard especially if it's a more formal process and the child needs information afterwards again if this is a more formal process there may be a decision making body either in the administration or a court that's going to make a decision uh, about the child or for the child and then the child actually needs to be informed and the decision making body should take the responsibility to inform the child so that the child knows what the result was and also gets to know that the child's views was taken were taken into account but also to to tell the child well it's not your responsibility because that might be a burden on the child to know that it's they have followed the child's views it's always the adult's responsibility to to make the final decision especially if it's a more sensitive area like a, a family conflict or a child protection case for instance so, but the information all the time needs to be adapted to the child's evolving capacities, um, be it a child uh, with a disability or not. So uh, I'll look then at some concluding observations to the Nordic states and concluding observations is uh, what is uh, uh, given to the states after the com Committee on the Rights of the Child or the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. After they have had the, the state party report and they get a lot of additional information and then have a dialogue with the state or the uh, delegation from the state in Geneva and then issue, uh, based on all of this information, the committees issue recommendations to the states. And I've, I've gone through the concluding observations to the last to the Nordic states uh, the last time they were before those two committees. Um, to Denmark, I do it mostly alphabetically. <laughs> um, the CRPD in 2014 uh, told Denmark in relation to forced treatment of children who are hospitalized. Um, the committee recommends that the state party abolish forced hospitalization and treatment of children in psychiatric hospitals and provide adequate opportunities for information and counseling to ensure that all children with disabilities have the support they need to express their views. Um, so this is particularly in relation to forced treatment uh, of hospitalized children. Um, which may often relate in this respect, at least to children with, with disabilities or with a psychiatric uh, disorder, to put it that way. Um, in, in the CRC committee's last concluding observations, children with disabilities uh, was one of six main concerns, but there was nothing on participation to Denmark in those. 
the reason why some things are emphasized by the committee and other things not may not be that it's not uh, a challenge or problem in that country, but it's it's very much up to those that provide the committee with uh, supplementary information like NGOs um, or, or the national um, human rights institutions or, or um, children's ombudsperson. Um, if they don't stress a particular point, it may not be covered by the concluding observations. It may also, of course, be that everything is fine. <laughs> um, to Finland in, in um, uh, well, actually, Finland ratified the CRPD only in 2016. Uh, the state party report was uh, submitted in 2019, but it's not yet been reviewed. I must say that the Committee on the Rights of the Child has not been able to meet at all in Geneva during the last year of the pandemic. Um, so they've only had digital meetings and, and they are not, I mean, none of the committees have been able to, to meet actually. Um, and they've, they, they have digital meetings, but they haven't so far had any dialogues with uh, states. Um, so that's why there haven't been any concluding observations actually on, on the reports that have come later than 19. 2019. Uh, in 2011, the CRC committee said to Finland, um, the committee is concerned that the right of children with disabilities to be heard is not properly realized. It also said that the views of children, including children with disabilities, should be given due weight in accordance with the age and maturity of the child. So it's rather general, but still it shows that this is a challenge in the country. Uh, to Iceland, the CRPD uh, was ratified in 2016 also, but there's been no report submitted yet, not on the um, website anyway of the committee. Um, the CRC committee in 2012, that's the last concluding observations to Iceland, said that the committee is also concerned that all children may not have equal opportunity to express their views and said that the state should ensure that children's views are given due consideration in courts, schools, relevant administrative and other processes concerning children and in the home, including children with disabilities. So they were particularly highlighted and you can see that all of these arenas um, should take children's views more into account than they already do. To Sweden, I, I take Norway, Norway afterwards because it's it's later and it's uh, it's more specific, I'd say. Um, the CRPD committee in 2014 said that the committee is concerned that children with disabilities are not systematically involved in decisions concerning their lives and that they lack opportunities to express, express their opinions on matters concerning them. So they are not systematically involved and they lack opportunities to express their opinions. So it's not necessarily necessarily that they express their opinions, but they are not heard, but they lack those opportunities. Uh, the committee then recommended that the state party ensure existing uh, safeguards and adopt additional ones to protect the right of children with disabilities to be consulted in all matters concerning them. So this can show us that existing safeguards may already be there, but they are not used to, to the extent that they should be, and there should also be additional safeguards. Uh, the CRC committee in 2015 followed up on this and said that the committee is concerned that children with disabilities are not systematically heard with regard to issues that concern them and lack opportunities to express themselves, as highlighted by the committee on the rights of persons with disabilities. So you can see that it's very much the same um, uh, concern that the other committee had, so it's picked up by this committee. Um, the recommendation was that the state should ensure, or the government or also local authorities, should ensure that existing safeguards for the right of children with disabilities to be consulted on all matters concerning them are effectively implemented. implemented. So using the existing safeguards that are already there, but then with the addi uh, addition of maybe new safeguards that was mentioned by the CRPD committee. That's not highlighted in this one. 
Then to Norway in 2018, the CRC committee gave the recommendation under the right to be heard that uh, Norway should increase its efforts to strengthen compliance in practice with the child's right to be heard, in particular with regard to children who are more vulnerable to exclusion in this regard, such as children with disabilities. And I think it is a good point that they actually mention children who are more vulnerable to exclusion in this regard, because that is, is much of the problem, that um, children may be heard at a general level in individual cases as well, but children with disabilities somehow are overlooked in this regard. So, so to pay specific attention to various groups of children that might be vulnerable to, to exclusion, it may also be children with a migrant background or a different language than, than the main language of the country, for instance. But children with disabilities were, partic were particularly highlighted. Uh, the CRPD committee is even more recent. It's from 2019. Um, the committee was concerned about the lack of accessible mechanisms to ensure that children with disabilities enjoy their right to be heard, to have their views taken into account on matters affected them, particularly in education, and there was a quite a long concern, but it's it's mostly mirrored in the recommendation. And uh, to keep it not too long, I, I have preferred than to put the, the recommendation because this is what um, the government of Norway is actually supposed to do with this. It is to promote comprehensive strategies and accessible mechanisms for the full and effective participation of children with disabilities in decision-making processes affecting their lives, guaranteeing their right to have their views taken into account on matters affecting them, particularly in education, beyond the issue of the school environment and bullying, respecting their evolving capacities and ensuring that they have access to accessible and child-friendly complaints mechanisms. So um, it's about making these comprehensive strategies and accessible mechanisms so that children know they have the right to be heard. It should be easy to use these mechanisms to, to express their views. Um, and the, uh, particularly in education. And uh, the committee says beyond the issues of the school environment and bullying. And I think that might be because there's been a particular focus on this area in Norway recently. So maybe schools and education authorities have become better at listening to children when it comes to school environment and bullying, even um, listening to children with, with disabilities, which they may not have done uh, before. But, but uh, this is at least an indication that they, they may have started doing it in this respect, but they should actually be heard beyond uh, school environment and bullying and in other educational issues as well like the classroom, um, I mean, like uh, special education, how they want that to be done and things like this. Uh, and respecting their evolving capacities is always important for all children, but it may be you should have some, some specific um, regard to that when it comes to children with disabilities. And also stressing the uh, need for access to accessible and child-friendly complaints mechanisms. This is not something we've seen uh, to the other countries. And this is important for, for children's rights in, in all aspects, actually, um, to have complaints mechanisms if their rights are violated or the child thinks their rights are violated in some way or other, because that's how some other body can monitor the way, for instance, the schools are doing this or the education authorities for that matter. So we can see that there have been, I would say, more and more specific uh, concerns and recommendations with regard to children's rights, uh, children with disabilities and their right to be heard uh, over the years. And, and not least when it comes to the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, Disabilities. It's really quite specific, this one, I think. So this is my final slide. So uh, all in all, of course, children with disabilities have the same right as any other child to express their views and to be listened to and have their views taken into account. Um, but they may be more vulnerable to exclusion in this regard, and adults need to be aware of this possibility of exclusion and pay particular attention to, to uh, listening to children with disabilities and to provide opportunities, assistance and mechanisms for this right to be realized in practice in all aspects of children's lives.
And as we've seen from all the recommendations to the Nordic countries, the right is not yet fully realized in the Nordic countries. So the report that we are going to hear more about in the second, I think, is really timely and important. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for a very comprehensive overview of uh, the rights of children with disabilities, both within the Convention on the Rights of the Child, but also on uh, the con in the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And I see there are quite a few questions that have popped up in the chat box, which is great. I'll turn to Jessica in a minute to, to, to start um, reading those out to us. But I also just wanted to flag um, General Comment 7 of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which makes specific recommendations, uh, specific reference to meaningful participation of children. Um, and, I, and I really appreciated your, your, your comments, Professor, around what types of participation are we talking about and, and giving us some sense of what are the obligations of the state to deliver on these particular articles, both in the CRPD as well as in the CRC. But I'm gonna stop talking and hand over to Jessica to give a sense of some of the questions that we have. Jessica. Thank you very much, Charlotte, and thank you, Kirsten. Uh, it's really interesting, and uh, thank you, participants, for all the comments and questions. Uh, please keep them coming. Links, uh, everything you want to post in the chat. And as we said in the chat, we will uh, uh, send them out to you afterwards, so the presentations and the links, so, so no need to worry about that. Uh, I could start with some questions for you, Kirsten. Um, here is one. Uh, uh, the commenter says, it's hard impossible to formalize that children's views have to be taken into account but the question is how can this become a meaningful event something that goes beyond the mere actualization of the right to participate uh, in other words in what way can policy facilitate that next to giving levers to share a story that the story is genuinely listened to yeah. This is uh, something that is really uh, on the, I would say, on top of the agenda when it comes to children, children's participation uh, generally, uh, and, and it's much discussed uh, internationally as well. Um, and uh, and one of the ideas that has been been uh, taken up is to to um, make an obligation on um, authorities or whoever it is that uh, listens to children and and uh, is supposed to make uh, policies to give feedback to to the children that they have uh, consulted with uh, to to tell them how they have taken children's views into account uh, and and uh, also to show them actually from if this is in a written document uh, i mean the policy may end up as a written document to to show the children that this is what we've done to to take your views into account and not just listen to you but actually take it seriously and and uh, and um, also maybe use some of your ideas and so on so feedback to children has been mentioned as an important uh, um, way to ensure that children are not only listened to more tokenistically. Um, yeah, and, and also, of course, to, to have this um, intense exchange, as, as the Committee on the Rights of the Child said, that it should be a process um, so that children are not just listened to once, but they should be brought into the process again, maybe at the later stage, because making a policy is often a quite long-winded uh, procedure. So um, this may be another way. But I, but I think it's about engaging with the children, not just once, but on several occasions. And here is another question. Uh, should we also regard nonverbal expressions such as crying, expressions of fear or other types of emotional and physical responses? Uh, do you have any opinion on that? Uh, should we treat emotional or other nonverbal expressions as views? Um, that is also an, an interesting question, uh, which we discuss because um, the, the Committee on the Rights of the Child has have, have said, as I, as I said, that a child may express him or herself from its very early, the beginning of life. And that means you have to listen to the child's way of crying or, or other forms of expression. Um, on the other hand, when it comes to, to um, expressing a view on a certain matter, um, if you use 
um, this kind of, of non-verbal expressions. I mean, it's it's easy to say that it should be possible to express yourself uh, in that way too, and it should be read as a kind of expression. But um, it will then be much up to the interpretation of the adult uh, what the child actually means by this uh, expression. So one should be a bit cautious uh, and, and it will depend on the circumstances, I think, whether you could um, interpret this as a, as a view. I mean, if, if it's a child that cries out when you touches the child, it's, it's a clear sign that the child doesn't want to be touched, or it could at least be a clear sign of that, but it depends again on the, on the situation. Uh, but if a child um, cries out in other um, situations, it may not be so clear or, or uses body language. Well, as I say, it depends on, on the situation, whether you can interpret it as a view or, or not. And then we have uh, one last question from the chat. Uh, what are your thoughts about the current situation, meaning the pandemic and uh, the children's and youth's right to be heard? Um, it's a bit difficult to have a general view on that because I don't know so much about how that is in the other countries. Um, but I know that uh, children in Norway have stressed uh, the need for um, classroom, I mean, for teachers, for instance, to, to um, try to meet with children, five children, maybe four or five outside because they, if they cannot meet physically, uh, they could meet outside to, to just uh, talk and, and have their views uh, on how things are done, for instance, in the, or not least, in, in when they have digital uh, education. I think, uh, or at least my impression is that children are not, um, maybe not to the same extent as they would otherwise uh, be listened to in, when it comes to, to, for instance, the way the education is, is done at the moment. Um, this is, of course, a rather general statement from myself, and it varies a lot from school to school and from teacher to teacher. When it comes to the education authorities and, and uh, the policies, or, or I mean, whether you should have digital uh, teaching or not, or, or how you could organize the school day to have half the school or, or, or other half. I, I think children feel that they are not listened to because they would like to be at school as much as possible. And sometimes it's, it's well, um, at least the adults think it's not possible. Um, yeah, but I, I think in a way it's more difficult when when I'm talking maybe now most about uh, school, but uh, because that is where uh, children have their everyday life normally, and it's been so changed by the pandemic. And I think it is more difficult for children to make themselves heard when they are at the other end of a digital connection uh, with a screen between themselves, uh, or two screens between themselves and the teacher. Um, yeah. Thank you. We have one more question. Uh, how do the conventions ensure the issue of representation? Uh, it's problematic to refer to children with disabilities as a homogeneous group mm -hmm. that will also exclude many children who will continue to be excluded. How, do you have any comments on that? Um, um... There, there isn't anything, well, actually in general comment number, no, in the, the convention article 12 uh, on the rights of the child, uh, it says that the children could be heard directly or through a representative. And then there is a discussion in general comment number 12 on who could that representative be. And in, in many cases, they say parents would be a proper rep representative of the child uh, if there is no conflict of interest. Um, and that may be uh, in relation to health authorities if, if one doesn't think that the child um, has a different view than the parent and maybe in relation to education. But if it's about child protection um, cases or, or child um, or parental conflict, child custody cases, it's not so easy to have parents as the representative. Um, and then there are many other possibilities. It should be a person that the child trusts and can talk to uh, rather freely because that is part of, of the right is to express his or her views freely. And that means you need to, to talk to a person that you actually feel free when you when you talk to. And, and it must also be a person that you can trust to give a proper 
um, representation or a, um, a proper summary of what the child has said, or or maybe write it down and read it to the child if it's a child that can understand it when it's read out. Um, so it's. Um, there could be various forms of representatives. They could be more formal, but then they need to meet with the child uh, so that the child feels safe with that person. It could be a teacher, it could be a kindergarten, kindergarten teacher. There are many possibilities of various rep representatives. Uh, it could also be an expert, um, psychological expert in these child protection cases or in uh, special education cases. But then, um, I mean, they should, normally speak directly to the child if it is possible to speak directly to the child because um, that is the way you get the best impression of what the child actually wants to express when you can see the the body language and the facial expressions together with what they might or might not express uh, verbally um, so even if it's it's another representative it might also be good to have the child there together with for instance the parents uh, when they speak to somebody. So it has to be adapted to the particular situation and the, the case, if it's a case in question or the issue in question. Thank you very much, Kirsten. Uh, yes, please keep the comments and questions coming. And now over to you, Charlotte. Thank you very much, Jessica, for, for moderating that session. And Professor, I had a really quick question for you. If you could just quickly tell us about how do we reach parents as duty bearers in terms of this convention on the rights of persons with disabilities as well as the crc what can we do to make sure that parents are more aware of their children's right to participate mm. oh that's another important uh, question um i i guess it could be through um, professionals that meet the child the professionals should be trained in children's participation i know that they are not they are not always properly trained trained on that but it could be from the very beginning the the health uh, care professionals that parents meet with when the child is is just born if if the child has some kind of disability at that uh, stage but that's very early but then when when the child um starts well no i i think it has to be an ongoing process if it is if it's about a child with a disability whenever it occurs i mean it might be uh, from the birth or it might be from uh, a later stage um professionals that have to do with the child uh, should always be aware of the child's right to participation and should be able to also guide the parents on that. Uh, apart from that, I would say perhaps through organizations um, that may reach parents, um, organizations of, of um, parents with children with disabilities um, should also be very much aware of this right of the child to participate and, and make sure that it actually is or, or or that the parents know that it's something they should do and and also to guide the parents on how they can actually do it in practice because it might be a challenge for many parents um Thank the you. the authorities i haven't talked about the authorities but they are the ones that bear the responsibility so they should actually have quite a lot of material out there they should should make campaigns uh, this go this is about children's participation in general but they should also have campaigns directed at uh, parents with uh, disabilities i think well thank you very much professor we certainly could continue this discussion but we do need to move along so again thank you so much Please thank you the questions coming and now we move to the next agenda item and for this, we will have um, a report on the See, Listen and Include report on the participation of children and young persons with disabilities in the Nordic region. And to help us get through this, is, we will be having Merit Lubarji. So over to you, Merit. Thank you, Charlotte, uh, uh, for giving me the floor and uh, uh, honored speakers. and. Uh, and experts. Um, I'll give you a brief uh, on the report and um, I'll tell you some about the background of this report and the project framework it, uh, it um, belongs to. I'll also give you an overview of the content of the report and uh, highlight 
uh, we have found. Finally, I'll give Sherry some of our concerns on how we could further our Nordic cooperation and ensure real participation and influence for more children and young people. The Nordic countries are carrying out both systematic and knowledge-based efforts to ensure participation for children and youth with disabilities in several areas. Nonetheless, it's um, evident that uh, we have a long way to go in securing the rights to be seen, listened to and involved in all areas of their life and on an equal footing as their peers. How this inequality affects them and the need for long-term sustainable measures to change this has been pointed out by youth delegates involved in this project all along. And we quote them throughout the report. I quote, you have to be strong to get your rights. The weakest children and young people with disabilities don't always get the help they need, but the strong ones do. It's difficult to get the right help if you don't speak the language of the system. In 2019, we at the Nordic Welfare Center were commissioned to initiate a project promoting children and youth right to be heard in the Nordic region. Our report, See, Listen and Include, is part of this project and it's out of several initiatives. It belongs to the Nordic Council of Ministers Action Plan for 2018 to 2022 for reinforced knowledge and dialogue on human rights for people with disabilities in the Nordic region. The goal is our role to endorse the right to participate to a greater extent and to increase also knowledge and cooperation in the Nordic region. We have worked to generally strengthening the child and youth perspective in the Nordic Council on Minister Cooperation on Disability. We have worked to increase the exchange of knowledge and experience. And we have worked to strengthen children's and youth rights and participation in society overall. This report is a result of Nor Nordic cooperation and sharing of experience. In the process of writing this report, Nordic experts and youth delegates have been involved and they have shared the knowledge with us. They have also, in addition to this report, aided us in the development of a model for integrating a child rights and youth perspective into the work of the Nordic Council of Ministers Disability Cooperation. This model is also a guide available for anyone who wants to work for, uh, to promote participation in the Nordic region. In the report, we highlight some of the major barriers to participation that children and young people commonly encounter. The findings in the report are based on inputs from experts and available research in the Nordic region and the countries. Even though this is not a systematic research review, the report provides important insights to the different conditions children and young people have and into the complexity of the obstacles and challenges children and youth face in different areas of their life. We find that in most areas in their life, they encounter a distinct gap between their rights and in their everyday life. And the gap quite often increases with age. We find that a recurring challenge for children and youth is the lack of suffi sufficient knowledge and competence among key personnel around them. When key personnel don't know what to do and what's required, this has consequences. Also, I quote one of the youth experts, expectations on children and young people with disabilities are too low. They are too many prejudices. And, ignore, uh, and ignorance regarding what is required, for instance, for working with people with disabilities. Lack of participation and influence over important areas of their lives impairs their living condi conditions in several, several areas. This comes in addition to 
the occurring episodes being excluded from the decision making that is really important to them. Another major challenge is the lack of access to areas and environments that are important. This is quite often due to physical hindrances, lack of universal design and sustainable means for participation that is not being used or provided. Consequently, they often face situations where they have less opportunities to take part in social life. They experience being excluded, excluded from social life, friends and peers. I quote, we find we kind of have a price tag on us and have to constantly fight for our rights. How do you find the energy to participate in the outside world when you have to struggle so much with the system? Everything related to support comes with a price. In the report, we describe a, a broad variety of methods and tools for participation that are available in the countries and in the Nordic region. We describe methods for participation in everyday life, preschool, school, leisure activities. We also highlight the need to become self-reliant, the transition to adulthood, and the need to ask and involve children and youth in research on their own well-being. Later today, after my speak, we offer insight to in, into some of the best, best practices that is described in the report directly from the national experts themselves. We also outline information on the uh, range of stakeholders in play. They, in, the, in the countries and in the Nordic region, they play an important role and they really make a difference. They play an important role in promoting participation and accessibility. In the report, we describe some of the most important key players, their roles, and also the obligations. Our shared vision for the Nordic region, as Thomas Blomqvist also told us about earlier today. We have a vision for a social, inclusive and sustainable Nordic region. This vision is not yet fully consistent with what children and youth experience today. The Nordic countries have now ratified both the Convention of the Rights of the Child and the Rights of People with Disabilities. A systematic implementation of the Convention is part of this agreement, so is the requirement to report to the UN committees and subsequently following up the recommendations, as Kirsten so brilliantly told us. And partic participation is a must. It's a corner cornerstone in the Nordic region's fulfillment and implementation on the conventions. But it's also a requirement for maintaining a social, inclusive and sustainable society. I quote, it is important that society starts to see children and young people with disabilities as a resource and enable us to do and be just that by providing us with education and work. As we've heard earlier today, participation contributes to personal development, better decision making, better decisions, and it contributes to a society being able to protect children and youth to a greater extent. Participation also prepares children and youth for active citizenship and it increases tolerance and respect for others. The gap between the opportunities available to children with and children without disabilities shall be reduced nationally and internationally. To reach this goal, we believe we need a knowledge-based and targeted work to, com to compliance to build the Article 12 in the Nordic region. Some concluding thoughts from us. A further Nordic cooperation represents a great potential. We believe through cooperation that we can close the gap by aiding, learning, leading and supporting each other. Primarily to accomplish this, we need to know more about if we are on the right track. 
This means applying necessary tools to identify who is left behind and why. We believe the best way to achieve this would be to apply indicators. That makes it possible for us to monitor development and living conditions for children and youth in the Nordic region. Furthermore, it would be beneficial to operationalize common Nordic targets and measures so that we can compare and aid each other. Another area it would be sensible to cooperate in would be our efforts on follow up the, on the recommendations on the UN committees that Kirsten went through earlier today. Later, analysis of the recommendations can be used to highlight common challenges and lay the foundations for methodical and targeted approach. Additionally, we need to investigate and look into or applied knowledge in the uh, for, for participation. There are a range of methods and practices that can be shared and applied to ensure participation today. But there is a need to not only spread this knowledge, but also to uh, uh, investigate and assure, ensure that the met methods that we use are both knowledge-based, targeted, and that they contribute to genuine participation. Finally, to ensure increased participation in the Nordic region, we need to involve children and youth. Nordic actors must involve children and youth in both knowledge sharing, debate and method development in the field. In the process of writing this report, Nordic experts and youth delegates have shared so much knowledge and expert with us. I would like to use this opportunity to thank you all. Um, it has been a pleasure and an honor. This report is as much yours as it's ours. Throughout the project period, we have also worked together in workshops. And tomorrow we will have our last meeting and gathering. Then we will discuss what should be the next step in Nordic cooperation on safeguarding equal rights to participate for all children and youth in the Nordic region. I close with a statement from our youth delegates. We need more politicians who care about human values. Society needs to become more humane. Far too often, cases involve acute help for children and young people with disabilities. Thank you. Merit, thank you very much for an excellent presentation um, and a great set of slides. Um, I mean, I think I took a lot away from the report. And for those who haven't seen or read the report, please do do so. Um, but I, get, I really appreciated you setting out some methodology on how to do this uh, by putting out some indicators, following up on the concluding observations. And again, like all the other speakers, you've really emphasized the importance of uh, meaningful participation of, of all children, including children with disabilities. Get ready for a very exciting second part of today's webinar. And for this section, what we will do is pivot very quickly to hear some best practices um, from various colleagues from Nordic countries. And to kick us off, we'll start off with a presentation on the Lego Braille bricks. And that will be given to us by Cecilia Exart Ekstrand, the representative of the Swedish Association of the Visually Impaired. Uh, over to you, Cecilia, and you've got 10 minutes. Thank you very much. I will now start sharing my screen. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm going to talk about Braille or Lego bricks as a tool for participation and inclusion for children with blindness in preschools and schools. We have few children with blindness in Sweden. In average, seven blind children per year are born. And only blindness is rare and the rate of more than one disability is high. The situation is similar in the Nordic countries. Children with blindness have complex needs of support 
as this is a very small group, the competence and knowledge about how to include children in preschools in schools vary a lot in Sweden. The National Agency for Special Needs Education and Schools offers courses guidance for teachers to ensure the access to equal educational opportunities for children with blindness in an inclusive settings. Children with blindness do not always have access to equal opportunities to participate, to develop and to learn as other children. They face more difficulties in achieving the rights to inclusion and social participation in all aspects of their lives. Many children tend to have a lot of contact with ad adults, but less contact with peers. Every child with blindness must be given early support with special attention to the need to be listened to, to express their views, and to have social interactions. Without early support to develop their social skills, to interact, cooperate, and play with other children, they risk to experience exclusion and that their voices do not count. This means that their rights to be heard and to be able to have influence over their lives cannot be fulfilled according to the CRC and CRPD, as we heard Kirsten mentioned earlier. Why do we have Braille on Lego bricks? During 2018, the Lego Foundation in Denmark started a project with Braille on Lego bricks, together with the Danish organization of visually impaired. The Lego Foundation was inspired both by the Danish organization and by the Brazilian organization who came up with a prototype with Braille on Duplo bricks. The Lego Foundation saw that Braille on bricks matched with their vision of learning by playing. A prototype of a box containing Braille bricks and base plates was developed together with teaching material. During 2018 and 2019, Denmark, Norway, UK and Brazil tested the materials together with children, teachers and parents, and the responses were positive. The boxes arrived in over 20 countries in the end of 2020 and the beginning of 2021. The Lego Braille Bricks is a combined toolbox and pedagogical concept. It's not a toy, but should be used in a playful way. As Lego Bricks are well known for many children, it's a very positive tool to use in learning situations. The target group for the boxes and the teaching material are teachers in preschools and schools and other educational settings where there are children with blindness. The boxes are a donation from the Lego Foundation and will be handed out free of charge. Before we send out the boxes, we invite all teachers in preschools and schools to online information about the teaching material and the concept. We do underline the importance of interactions and social cooperation with the other children in order to increase participation. We are going to follow up how the teachers are using Lego Braille bricks in learning situations. And we will especially ask about participation and inclusion. Now there's a slide about the content, the box and some of the contents. The boxes contain 300 bricks and three base plates. There are both braille and printed letters and numbers on the bricks and countries they receive their national letters. Teachers have access to a wide range of teaching materials as well as webinars to be found on the legobraillebricks.com website. And there is on slide 
right now. And there are a lot of activities uh, divided into pre-braille activities for children from five years and braille activities from six and up to 14. And they can only have only they can also have tips about additional materials to use with the Lego Braille bricks. Uh, can Braille bricks be a tool for participation and inclusion? As Surf wanted to join the Lego Braille bricks project, as we saw a fantastic opportunity to promote Braille and that the bricks and the teaching material can be a useful and important tool for increased participation and inclusion in preschools and schools. The aim is to learn children with blindness braille in a playful way and to use Lego in education according to the Lego Foundation's vision of a future where children learn through play. It can be a challenge for teachers in preschools and schools to include children with blindness. And teachers need different tools when they work with inclusion. The Lego Braille bricks and the teaching material are a concrete and easy tool to use in preschools and schools. And it can contribute to opportunities to express themselves. The focus is on uh, learning uh, through play together with sighted peers. And here's a picture of uh, several children playing with the bricks. The concept of learning by, <clears throat> by play includes the development of social skills through collaboration, communication, and understanding other people's perspective. The aim of the Lego Braille Bricks activities is both to work with skills commonly worked in schools as academic skills and specific to visually impaired children, VI skills. Both are essential to deeply understand concepts and develop several skills. Several of the Lego activities are for two or more children. Uh, on the slide is visual impairment skills. Uh, some of the visual impairment skills are how to use a wide variety of nonverbal behaviors to improve communication, to engage in game pretend play activities, uh, verbal play with peers, participate with other children in both leadership and follower roles, request and accept help from others, use peers as a resource, negotiate with others to resolve problems. As children with blindness can have few social contacts with peers, the use of these materials can help children to interact with other children and their surroundings in different ways that can lead to increased participation. It can help children to express their views, to make friends, and to be active on different social arenas and can contribute to positive consequences for the child's well-being and self-esteem. When children start to build social interactions through Lego activities, it can be an important link to other activities in preschools and schools. And here is a slide it said social interactions. You can see two children, their hands. They are playing with the Lego Braille bricks. Uh, and finally, we are convinced that the Lego Braille bricks can contribute to promote the right to learn and to use Braille to increased access to participation and inclusion in preschools and schools, so that every child with blindness will be seen, listened to, and included. And 
the last slide, the very important aspect is that with Lego Braille bricks, children and teachers can have fun. And on the slide, there is Braille bricks and it says have fun. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cecilia, for a really very interesting presentation on Braille Lego bricks. And just to confess that I have a couple of those in my office. Um, and thank you very much for sharing with us how children learn through play and how Braille Lego bricks can enhance the social skills and overall social inclusion of, of children with disabilities. So I want to move on quickly to Anne um, Simonsen. Uh, she's a specialist advisor with the Regional Center on Violence, Traumatic Stress and Suicide Prevention in the East Region in Norway. And Anne, you have 15 minutes. So over to you, please. I'll unmute and then I start to share my screen. Oh, I have to do it otherwise. Let me just share screen. And share sound and then share. And I hopefully you can see the same. There we are. Perfect. Thank you very much. And I've been, um, as you said, my name is Anne Simonsen. I'm a psychologist. I'm working on this center called the Regional Resource Center on Suicide Prevention and Violence and Trauma, which is kind of important because I come from another place than you. We, we are not especially dedicated to working with children with disabilities. But uh, of course, we made this, uh, what I'm going to present to you is a tool that we made to to raise the, the to increase children's participation all, uh, all over for everyone in the community working with children in uh, in a lot of different settings. But of course, uh, our aim is the prevention of trauma and violence. But uh, of course, if if the subject is like this, it says on the slide, talk to me. You can't just rush in and begin to talk about the serious, difficult uh, subjects, you have to begin with the overall uh, uh, mechanisms, how to open up in communication, how to get, uh, like the professor told us, how to really not just uh, open up or, or uh, let, uh, what did you say, let the children express their views, but really be heard and taken into account. And, uh, and uh, we have a way to go, uh, I think, in these issues. So I'm going to present to you a new tool that we made to, to uh, uh, which is really, as I say, aimed at uh, uh, adults working somewhere in the communities with, uh, with children. And, uh, and the, the overall aim or goal of this, uh, this uh, tool is to disclose and, and talk about uh, the, if you have a, children that, a child that you are worried about, a lot of adults uh, are around children and in professional ways or in, in personal and private ways and that they have a worry uh, about the children, how they really uh, get along at home, how they're doing it, what's happening to them, is something bad happening to them. And lots of investigations show that we don't, we don't talk to the children directly enough about that and we have to do something about that. So I said where I'm from, the regional, uh, so our subjects or themes are traumatic stress, violence, and suicide prevention. But as I said, this is um, embedded in the overall work with children and adults in the, in the communities and in the services. So it's not like, um, it's, it has to be in, in, the, in the situation of normal conversations. But as we, uh, I will not uh, say anything more about Article 12, but I think uh, our main goal is the same as, as it says in this uh, Conventions on the Rights of the Child, that really it's about uh, making, augmenting or raising the children's uh, possibility to be heard. 
And we had a lot of investigations and reports, uh, even in Norway, that says, and um, I don't know about the other Nordic countries, but uh, maybe it's the same for you, that uh, this is not fully realized in, in the Norwegian services for vulnerable, vulnerable children with or without disabilities. I guess it's the same, same, but not that uh, some differences. And uh, we see that uh, um, grown-ups and adults working with children, they investigate and they take decisions on behalf of the children in the child welfare services and other places. And they, in, in um, many, many occasions, they do not at all hear with the children or take their views in really into account and we wanted to change that and think how can we change that 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 is the big question because i i'm sure that everyone agrees like in a seminar like this or when we are out there talking to the helpers that we are designed to help they all agree with us they um, no one is against children's participation but then in the middle of the storm, uh, it, it, uh, it's lost somehow. So we thought a lot about how can we educate or help people, grown-ups that want to do good, they want to include children, but they, the, it seems like uh, uh, it's uh, something that comes in the way for it uh, when we're out there especially for some children and especially for some children uh, in, uh, exposed to violence or abuse. And I guess it's a lot of the same. We know that a lot of children with disabilities are a high risk group for uh, violence and abuse, of course, and, uh, and uh, for other um, lacks in services. So we, we think a lot and we, and it's also this, I guess you heard in, when in the field of trauma and trauma-informed care, I guess it's the word that uh, most of you have heard about. We have this big shift is from, uh, it's like the headlines are like this, and so, um, the shift from asking children, what is wrong with you? What are your disabilities or your faults or your diagnosis is to what happened to you? Because we now have a lot of knowledge about that uh, adverse childhood experiences uh, are at the bottom or at the root of uh, many uh, psychiatric and, and learning and uh, life and emotional disabilities and, and dysfunctions for children and youth and adults. So we really have to ask the question, what has happened to you? And we get that in focus. And if we should ask that question, we have to talk to the children themselves. So we thought a lot about it. How, how can we do that? Because uh, it's, uh, this is the old chart. I guess you, some of you have seen it as you, if you're in this business. That, uh, how do you change behavior? And now we're talking about the helpers. How do we change from not listening to children and not enough listening to children and not, do not engage uh, children in, in talking about their own situations? How do we change that? And we have to do, if we have to do, uh, make someone change behavior, it's, uh, you can see on the top there is uh, the smallest effect is uh, on this passive uh, learning modes that uh, to read about something, to even hear about it, like we're doing here today, to see someone do it or see a video demonstration, it helps, but it's not fully uh, enough engaging to make someone really change their behavior. To do that, you have to yourself take part in the discussion. That uh, raises the, the possibility that you learn something if you really raise your voice and take part in a discussion about it. How can we do this in my workplace? How can I, uh, that uh, works in kindergarten or somewhere, how can I make uh, children engage more? Or really to rehearse the behavior in a realistic context. But we as a competence center, we don't have the opportunity to, we can go, we can't go out there and, and work with everyone. And if you work in a, school or in the kindergarten or somewhere, you don't all the time, you don't meet children exposed to violence. So you don't get too much training. You can't rehearse in a realistic context. But we wanted to do almost that. So we made this simulation game. And here I'm going to show you a, a small movie that we made to, to you can uh, look for yourself how, how this was made. 
Jag syns att du är väldigt modig som berättar det som du berättar. Och här är det viktigt att vi reagerar helt riktigt och att du är helt säker. När uh, vuxna får en oro eller en bekymring så blir de osäkra på hur de ska uh, snacka med barn. Och vi ska man ska bli flinke nu så må man öva. Vi ville lägga en sida som kunde vara ett verktyg för de som jobbar med barn och unga så att de kunde få ett hjälpmedel till att öva sig och snacka med barn. Och så gråter han ett på. Har jag förstått det riktigt då? Ja. Vi vet att uh, många som jobbar med barn och unga varje dag, uh, de har barn och unga som de är väldigt bekymrade för. De gruer sig till att ta de samtalen med barnen. Det är viktigt att han visar att han är i sin sinne, för det att då blir det där då det blir svårt för de vuxna där har på lust att trekka dig eller rikt ut. Vet vad du om du törr att svara tillbaka eller. Vad i fana? Ni alla taper. det vi har gjort i spillet är baserat på grundig research och tät dialog med fagfolken hos RVTS. Barn trenger at vi tør å snakke med dem om det som er vanskelig og det som gjør at de ikke har det bra, for at de skal få det bedre. Det jeg ønsker aller mest er at de som bruker dette verktøyet skal sitte igjen med en følelse og tenke at denne samtalen kan jeg ta. Jeg tør å ta den samtalen. Jeg er en trygg voksen som tør å snakke med barn. Spør det meg da! So easy and so difficult. Just ask me, he says. But, uh, so we made this simulation game and uh, this is how it looks like. I mean, if, if some of you um, uh, dare to try it out in Norwegian or confident enough in Norwegian or Swedish or Danish, you can try uh, go in and look at the web address down to the left, snakkemebarn.no, and you can try it. Who do you want to talk to? We have uh, at the moment nine children in different ages, different uh, problems, different situations. We have Lilian Ole, which is in kindergarten, and Hugo and Eben, which is in uh, the small the school, the small children's school. We have Muhammad and Victoria, which is uh, 16 years and all that. Really a challenge to, to talk to. We have made it a bit complicated. So uh, then you can. Um, alone or together as a group, you can talk in, in your own settings, you can uh, open the simulation and you can go into the role as a uh, grown up, which is a teacher or a, a nurse or something, and, and try out, you get questions and, uh, and answers and you see where, where does it go, what is it that builds trust, how do we open up, how can we get little Hugo to share with us his thoughts or what's, oh, sorry, that when you get the, that's a cool thing about the simulation game and, and this gamification, you get uh, uh, immediate response. You get this red or green uh, comments on the screen and you can see the really experience, how is this? What, what does, it, and at not at least, what does it do to me? How, how can I be? Uh, better or more confident in this. So I guess that what we, what we reach over for this, but try it out. And uh, it's, a, it's a great possibility to, to learn and rehearse for adults meeting children. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Anna. And there's a lot of interest already I see in the chat. And thank you for sharing the simulation game with us. Um, but also I think for a very candid you know, conversation about some of the challenges that still exist and that occur in terms of children's participation. And then I think, you know, introducing the discussion around violence against children with disabilities. So, so thank you very much. A great contribution to today's discussion. Um, now we would like to pivot to a discussion around safety walks method for shaping a safe school. And this will be presented by Siri Mor Moravsky. Uh, Siri is a researcher with the Swedish Agency for Participation in Sweden. And Siri, you have 15 minutes. Thank you, Charlotte. Hi, 
I'm going to talk about saved walkthroughs. That is a method for shaping a safe school together with, with students with disabilities. And my name is Siri Moravsky, and I am working at the Swedish Agency for Participation. And I'm going to start with saying a few words about uh, the ag agency I'm working for. We, are a, we have a director and we are around 50 employees. Uh, we are an agency under the Ministry of Social Affairs and we are one of 342 agencies in Sweden. And what are we doing? We are trying to find ways for everyone to participate in society. Finding ways for policy to make real changes and collecting and developing knowledge. And what are we trying to reach? The objectives of the policy uh, we are working with is to achieve equality in living conditions and full participation for people with disabilities in a diverse society and actively contribute to increased gender and equality and, and to consider the rights of children. And so what have we been, done, been doing uh, about safety in school? We have been working with the topic safe schools uh, the last two years. In 2019, MFG carried out an activity to identify obstacles to safety in schools for students um, with disabilities. And then we uh, conducted a pilot study with safety walkthroughs together um, with um, students with disabilities. And the results from the walks uh, resulted in the report Creating a Safe School, uh, which you can find on our webpage, uh, mfg.se. Uh, the report is in Swedish. Before I tell you more about the results uh, from the walks, I want to um, talk about why the issue about safety in school is important. It is important because safety is the foundation to participation in school, to even be willing to go to school and to reach knowledge goals, etc. And what do we mean with safety? We mean that safety is to feel welcome and included in school. We also know that some students feel less safe than others. And among that group are uh, students with disabilities. We also know that and it is really important to remember that it is the right to feel safe and that uh, we can find in the UN Convention on the Right of the Child and also in the, in the Convention on the right, Rights of Persons with Disabilities and also in Agenda 2030. And I think that the Professor uh, Kirsten Sandberg uh, told us really good about the two conventions and how they work together. So the method uh, itself, safety walkthroughs, the purpose of the method is to increase safety and participation. The purpose is also to identify and remove obstacles to safety. The method is often used by Swedish municipalities in places that are pursued as unsafe. Uh, and that's, for example, squares, parks, residential areas, and also all kinds of public uh, areas. And in this method, the participants visit the places. So how did we do? Um, we carried out three uh, safety walks, uh, walkthroughs 
um, at three upper secondary schools in three different municipalities together with students with disabilities. The walks were carried out outside the classrooms, for example, in hallways, cafeterias, schoolyards, locker rooms, etc. And the reason for that is that students feel less safe outside the classrooms. So we wanted to um, walk uh, outside the classrooms. The groups uh, were around uh, six to ten students in each group because it's, it's, it, it is really important that the, that the groups aren't too big so everyone uh, feels safe enough to share their thoughts. The, the students co-planned the walk to include important places for safety. We stopped at every place to talk about if it was or if it was not a safe place and why. Um, we could identify five uh, obstacles uh, to safety uh, through these uh, walkthroughs. And those were poorly considered individual solutions, places with high visibility, poor sound environment, conflicts at school, and flaws in the organization of the schools. And now I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about every obstacle. I'm going to start with poorly considered individual solutions. Um, and in one of the walks, we, watch, we met one student who had problems with concentrated in the classroom. Therefore, the school had created an individual stu uh, study room for this student, which is really good. But the problem with this study room was that the one wall was a, a glass wall. Uh, facing a corridor where a lot of students walking and talking and sometimes knocking at the, at the glass wall towards this study room. And that made this study room uh, an unsafe place and a really stressful place for this student. We also saw a lot of individual solutions to increase access accessibility in the school. For example, elevate, elevators. There was one student who needed the elevator to move around in the school. But the classmates, they could take the stairways. Here, it would be much better to make all parts of the school accessible to all students. That makes the whole class, that makes that the whole class can go together and does not, doesn't need to split up when they are on the way to the classroom, for example. Places with high visibility. Places with high visibility are, for example, big entrances, hallways, schoolyards, and locker rooms. And these are places where you might not want to be seen, but you are seen, and that make uh, that makes these places unsafe uh, and stressful for the students. Poor sound environment. Um, poor sound environment uh, do we find in hallways, uh, big entrances, uh, and also in the school cafeteria. For some students with disability can pour uh, sound environment be the reason for why the students don't go to school at all, but it can also be a reason why, why these students don't visit the cafeteria for lunch. Conflicts at school. Conflicts at school, uh, of course, um, in rooms where students can't choose who they're going to meet, for example, in long hallways, um, and also in rooms where there are lack of adult attentions. And 
that are in many rooms outside the classroom. Uh, and we know that there are a lot of ways to work um, against this, for example, to shed schedule in, an, in another way. For example, schedule adults in school uh, that they are, have to walk through uh, certain hallways, but also to schedule that all students don't have breaks at the same time. Flaws in the organization of the school. Um, flaws in the organization of the school uh, can be suddenly changed um, schedules, for example, uh, where classroom changes uh, or when the teacher changes. And that can be really stressful uh, and feel unsafe for the, uh, the students. One group of uh, students told us about that the school had introduced a mobile ban, which made the students feel unsafe and stressed because the students used the mobile as a tool to check the schedule and also the time. Both, ex both of these examples that I have mentioned uh, can be very necessary for the school to make. Uh, what we mean is that it is important to involve the students when these kind of changes are being made. One way to increase safety in school is to involve the students. Students with uh, disabilities possess important skills. They are the ones who know what makes them unsafe and what solution that will improve the school. Uh, it is also a very efficient way of working. When you involve the student, it is easier to do the right uh, from the start. If you create safe school environments for those who are least safe, the environment improves for everyone. And with that, I want to say thank you. Thank you so much, Siri, for that. And thank you for really underscoring the importance about speaking to students with disabilities and emphasizing the point that they know what's unsafe. Um, so it seems like a very innocuous point, but it's a very important piece. It speaks to the whole discussion around participation and ensuring that there is um, voice um, of this of children and young people with disabilities so thank you so now we're going to move to our next speaker and our next speaker is maria kreutz uh, she's a senior advisor with the nordic welfare center and she will speak about a, a book a tactile language and it is called if you can see it you can support it so over to you maria and you've got 15 minutes Thank you so much, Charlotte, and good afternoon, everyone. It's so nice to know that there are so many participants out there. Uh, and even though we can see each other, it's good to know that there are so many who are interested in this important topic. And I will tell you a little bit about a book. If you can see it, you can support it. And the question uh, for me when, when they asked if I could uh, present something from this book is how to support when there are challenges in the work to ensure communication and participation for children with deaf blindness. So we have communication, we have uh, participation, and we have deaf blindness. Three very big um, themes to talk about in these 15 minutes and where to start. I will just start briefly with the, with the word deaf blindness, because if you think deaf blindness as you don't hear anything and you can't see anything, then I assume that many of you think, oh, but this, this doesn't concern me. I don't have to, I can just grab a cup of coffee now and, and so on. But please stay because it's so much broader than just totally deaf and totally blind. 
It also involves the disabilities that includes communication uh, challenges with communication development in so many different ways. So you can use this uh, pedagogic and these methods that is uh, that are explained in this book. You can use it much broader than just think about deaf blindness. If we say combined vision and hearing loss, maybe you can just feel a little bit more, but also if you think of a, ch a child or a, a preschool or something, a school, an organization that, that includes children and youth with disabilities that involve the, the challenges with communication development, then I think you can, can grab something from it. And communication, that's the next next part. If you don't see, you don't hear, how, how do you communicate? Is it possible to communicate at all? And of course it is. And it was a question before when Professor Sandberg uh, have, uh, has had her presentation. It was, what about the unverbal gestures and so on, the unverbal movements and behaviors? Should that also include in the, in the way that children are expressing themselves? And she was, uh, she, she had a very good answer that, of course, we need to involve every expression, uh, expression but it's very difficult then to interpret, interpret it, what does it mean? And then it, it will be just from one to another, it could be different, uh, different uh, interpretations. And how should we look about that? How to do with that? How to deal with it? And something in, within this book uh, is, is a very going deeply on it, how to interpret it, uh, the utterances and the expressions that are unverbal. So it was it was very good that, that it came up earlier today and then we can, can connect it to, to this part. And then participation for children uh, with deaf blindness. Uh, we have already been talking, many of the present, early presenters have, have said that it's, this is a tricky part to involve children. It's a tricky part to involve children uh, in a right way and a meaningful way for all children. But then it comes to, to children and youth with disabilities. And then you have more challenges, but you have to do it anyway. And then we come to this one that there are unverbal um, unverbal expressions expressions and how do you how do you look look on that what to do with that so as um i don't know if it was mentioned but i'm working at the nordic welfare center i'm responsible for the deaf brand issues and we coordinate five different networks uh, within different uh, themes and topics one of them is precisely on tactile language and they uh, explore that we, we really need to collect the knowledge because there are knowledge about tactile language, but we need to collect it so we can have it in one place and we can spread it further out to the world. So that was the, the goal for this book. If you can see it, you can support it. It is um, including nine different, 19, sorry, 19 different uh, chapters with 19 different uh, authors and it both uh, a very deep theoretical part one of the some of the chapters are very theoretical but also there are uh, practical examples in in many chapters connecting to each other so this picture maybe you find a bit strange is this boy um, who are uh, having this motor saw in his face, tasting it with his mouth, exploring it actually. And the question is why? Why should we, why should we, why, why is it so important to have all this knowledge collected in a, collecting, collected in a book? When we put on our language glasses and give bodily tactile utterances a linguistic value, we can communicate with persons with congenital deaf blindness on a linguistic level. Why so many linguistic hi hi highlight 
quotes here in this sentence. Yes, because historical, it has always been said that uh, people with congenital deaf blindness, they, they are, are not, why do, don't they come to this um, language level? They communicate, but they cannot reach the, the conventional tactile sign language. And I also, I forgot to say in the beginning that for you who don't know anything about uh, deaf blindness, you separate between acquired deaf blindness. If you have acquired deaf blindness, you, you have established a language before the deaf blindness is set on. So you can either have a spoken language or a sign language. And then if your sight is getting lower, then you, you often go over to the tactile sign language. And if you have congenital deaf blindness, then it's so much more challenges within the communication and language development. And before they, we maybe thought historically that it would be the tactile sign language that should be the first language, the, not the mother tongue, but the first language for the children with congenital deaf blindness. But then we, they could see it, that, that it, it doesn't work that way. So it's something else because we, if we think that what also Professor Sandberg um, faced in the beginning, that all children want to communicate. They are social individuals who have a, 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 a longing for communicate with other people. Then what can we do to meet these uh, communication challenges for the, for the children and youth with congenital deaf blindness? So that's why it's so important to, to look on it in a, in a, with language uh, glasses on and not just think about it, that it's uh, movements or gestures or behaviors or something like that, meaningless. If you put your language glasses on, then you look at the child or the youth or the grown up with congenital deaf blindness. When they are doing some utterances or express something, then you look at it as meaningful and as a communication tool for them. As I said, there are uh, some theoretical parts in, in the book and then some practical parts as well. Uh, I am not going to go through this circle model, of course not, but I just want to, sh to show you that it's, uh, it's a bit complicated when you put this theoretical and linguistic part on it, then you can find that tactile language is just not that you, touch, you just touch someone and then mean something because you have to put it in different blocks and you have to look at it, look at it in, through uh, each of this block and then you can see how to interpret it. And uh, the first one is the linguistic categories. And as you can see, there are, are many um, theoretical parts within just that one. And then you need to go through the model. And this model is a help, is a method to, to know how to develop and to, to see where are the child or the youth uh, within their um, um, develop, uh, their development in the communication and language development. What phase, what is the next step? What should we do? What can we support with uh, to get further in the, the development? So even if you're not a, a speech therapist or a linguist, or, or something like that, you can read it and you can understand it because it's a practical part within it as well. Then you can you can uh, can understand more. Okay, how this uh, how do this connect to each other? The theoretical parts and the practical parts. This I think it's so important. Theory and practice that make a difference because uh, this is a, a quite young research field about the, the tactile language. We have um, many, many steps to go, uh, but we have started. 
but it doesn't mean anything with all those uh, knowledge collecting and theoretical parts if you don't try to use it and see if it works. Does it work at all? And how can we see the, the uh, difference for the children and for the youth within their language development? And something that we need to, to think about within this is that language must be sensorially accessible. Of course, if you don't see, if you don't hear, or if you have a combined vision and hearing loss, or if you don't express yourself with, with the spoken words, then it's extra, extra important that it should be uh, sensorially accessible. You can think that, oh, but that's obvious. Of course it is. But it isn't so obvious for me, who I use my, my language. I also can some sign language as older I get. It, 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 <laughs> I'm not so good at it anymore. But anyway, it's the first thing for me when I use the language. That's my spoken word, what I see, and so on. And I use, of course, my body my tactile mode modality, but I'm not so aware about it. You can go courses, how to stand when you are having a presentation in the webinar like this, but, but just in your daily, daily life, it just happens, the body language and the bodily tactile modality. So it's very, very important to know, to think about this, uh, how to do it sensorially accessible. Tactile sensations as the basis for development of tactile language. That means that you need to, to um, have experiences, do things with your body, explore the world. Uh, and then, then you maybe want to, to explore the motor saw with your mouth. Just about what is this? How, how does it feel? And then you can talk about it in the evening and, and you can use your bodily tactile modality. Tactile cognition and language development, that's also something that is uh, in the uh, theoretical part in the book, and then you have some practical examples how to, to know more about that. And tactile cognition, that's uh, quite new, it's not so new, but, but it's quite new and young research field as well. And it needs so much more than 15 minutes to talk about everything about this. But just to, 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 to understand that this is very complicated and you really need to have knowledge to, to support the people uh, who in the school or in the kindergarten so, kindergarten so they can use their fully potentials within their cognition and their uh, communication. Partners' contribution to language development in a bodily tactile modality. And that also was, um, uh, I referred to, to Professor Sandberg again, because she was also talking very much about the, the support and the responsibility with the surroundings. Uh, because uh, if the children and the youth they want to communicate, but they have uh, challenges with their communication development in just an, an ordinary spoken language or sign language, then it must be the environment that have more knowledge and they give the support to them so they can use their potentials in communication. Oh, now I see Charlotte. Nice to see you, Charlotte. <laughs> Good to see you too, Maria. <laughs> <laughs> what needs and responsibilities do we have as the, the policy makers, decision makers, or teacher in a school? We need to have this new perspective on uh, how, how to look on, on language. And we also need to ensure there is enough, enough knowledge, and that's so important. We need to create good social environments because it could, couldn't be only in the schools or in the kindergarten. It, it should be in the, in the society overall that, that people can be uh, supported. So I want you to put your language classes on in what level you you are and then i also want all of us to spread the good news about this this book with the knowledge with the theoretical parts and with the practical examples thank you excellent thank you for maria thank you for a fascinating presentation um i think there was much much to learn there i mean i think i appreciated the practicality of it 
Um, and I think, you know, talking about how do you move beyond speech therapy. And thank you very much for introducing what appears to be an emerging body of research on a top uh, and knowledge on tactical language, uh, making it practical, and then sharing with us some sort um, some thoughts around sens sensorial accessibility. So absolutely fascinating, and a lot more there to unpack. Thank so you. So we're going to move on to our next speaker, and our next speaker is Ivan. Um, Dengras and Ivan is oh, Ivan sorry is going to speak about young people's ways of organizing and raising their voice in the Nordic region. Ivan is from the Norwegian Association of Youth with Disabilities and Ivan you have 15 minutes. Thank you very much Charlotte and uh, everyone else who are participating and watching this webinar. So uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, youth uh, way of organizing and raising their voice in the Nordic region. Um, and I just want to start a little bit with explaining who we are as an organization. So I work as an advisor at the Unge Funktionssemere is what it's called in Norwegian. In English, it's uh, the Norwegian Association of Youth with Disabilities. And um, we are an umbrella organization with 37 member organizations. And uh, in total, we have almost 30,000 members, uh, which represent uh, a diversity of disabilities and chronic illnesses. Um, and uh, we have a, a general assembly of every other year, which uh, decide what our politics should be. Uh, we also have a board in between general assemblies and a secretariat, which works on a daily basis. Uh, and our overall goal is to ensure equality for youth with disabilities. And um, a little bit about how we work because uh, uh, the overall topic here, of course, is the Nordic region. And um, I will uh, try to speak a little bit general, but of course, my knowledge is mostly based in situation in, in Norway. Uh, but I think that's what I'm going to say should probably be um, similar in, uh, in a lot of the other countries. Uh, so first and foremost, what we do is that we try to impact uh, politicians and decision makers in important um, decisions uh, which concern uh, youth with disabilities. We also do awareness raising on what uh, it means to have a disability and uh, how people with disabilities can be a part of the society. Um, and in terms of uh, what the issues that we work with, uh, it uh, has to do with participation, uh, work, access to education, and uh, equal access to uh, um, a good health. Um, and um, of course, there are a lot of, when it, when it comes to disability, there are many topics you can work with, but we also always try to find a youth perspective in, uh, in, uh, in our work. I want to talk a little bit about why including youth with disabilities is important. Uh, a lot has already been said in this webinar, um, but uh, for us, it boils down to um, the overall saying of the disability movement, which is nothing about us without us. Um, you can't really make any policy uh, that's good, um, uh, that impacts youth with disabilities without also including that same group. Um, we also know that um, youth with disabilities face multiple barriers, um, both because they have a disability and because they are youth. Um, so we have to take into account 
double barriers or double discrimination in society. And um, what's also um, our experience from our work is that youth often have a different and valuable perspective that you don't get, always get from adults. Um, to take one example of that, um, in uh, the Norwegian Association of Youth with Disabilities, uh, we have worked more, uh, more and more um, the last few years on um, uh, people with disabilities, uh, sexual and reproductive health. And that's a topic that uh, the disability movement in general, and also in Norway, uh, has not been good enough to focus on. And so, it, at least in Norway, it has been a lot of youth activists who actually have driven uh, that topic to the forefront. And now we're seeing more and more uh, disability organizations working on this topic. So often, youth lead the way in important uh, issues of the future. Um, and, uh, and lastly, also, uh, the pandemic that we're in right now has, I think, shown why it is so important. Because we see that uh, uh, in terms of crises as such as this, uh, people with disabilities and youth um, have been disproportionately um, affected negatively on the pandemic. And so it's important to listen to those groups who are uh, impacted by the crisis that we are in. So what are some of the challenges that we're, that we're facing in our work and in terms of actually uh, involving uh, youth with disabilities in a meaningful way? Um, I want to uh, start that, uh, trying to answer that by um, uh, one problem that we often face is that um, uh, when it comes to disability issues in general, we have this sort of um, uh, consensus uh, uh, consensus that this is an important issue and that everyone agrees on disability issues, to say it like that. Um, and that can be good in some uh, some ways that, uh, you know, it, it seems um, that everyone can agree that people with disabilities should be able to participate in society, but often it leads to uh, complacency. It leads to uh, policymakers and decision makers um, not actually acting because it's not really an important enough issue to uh, be, be become prioritized on the political agenda. So. Uh, everyone agreeing is not always a good thing. Um, another, another barrier that we face um, that I know is the case for us, but perhaps even more in other Nordic countries, is that uh, financial support is often inadequate for youth uh, disability organizations. It's very often project-based uh, and it's very often uh, unpredictable. And so that means that it's often hard to uh, make meaningful change because uh, very often you need uh, essential financial support in order to actually uh, make meaningful change. Um, and uh, I also want to say that it's not, you know it's not uh, necessarily always that youth are organized in organizations often. Um, they're not necessarily a part of the disability movement, or even if they are, they're not necessarily always given a voice in disability organizations, which is also a problem. So, um, you know, uh, it's also important that the disability movement itself becomes more inclusive uh, uh, towards youth and raises the youth voices within their organizations. Um, because they are the future of the movement. And um, lastly, I think that another problem is that um, 
national authorities often don't understand what really listening to 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 youth means or what listening to people with disabilities mean. Um, often we experience that uh, governments uh, kind of involve people with disabilities and youth with disabilities um, very on a case-to-case -case issue uh, and maybe individuals which um, inspire them, not necessarily organizations. So um, I think it's important to, to, to kind of confront national authorities with that, that it's, you know, uh, the organizations which re represent uh, youth with disabilities should be uh, first and foremost consulted. Uh, and I want to end with talking a little bit about what is needed in, uh, in uh, the future. I think to kind of address uh, what I talked about earlier in terms of finances, um, in many Nordic countries, we have um, a proud tr tradition of um, national authorities supporting civil society in order to uh, have a voice. And I think that it's important to acknowledge the fact that there is a need for national authorities to strengthen the support that they give to uh, youth disability organizations. Um, and um, we were also talking earlier today and throughout the day about uh, CRPD and uh, CRC. Um, and I think that those conventions and the view of youth with disabilities as, as rights bearers um, is important. And if you look at those conventions, they really say that uh, children and youth with disabilities have to sit at the table where decisions are made. It's not enough that you have a process where the people in power get to decide and then maybe consult a youth with disabilities in order to check off a box and then move on. It's important that the people who are impacted by decisions are also at the table. Um, and there's also a need for more um, youth disability uh, umbrellas in all countries. Um, we have one in Norway, um, which is good. But I know that that's not necessarily the case in um, in all Nordic countries. So there's a need for for more uh, more umbrella organizations which can represent the broad uh, diversity of disability uh, youth youth with disabilities. And then all, to kind of uh, end off and to kind of uh, tie it into what we're talking about uh, in terms of Nordic cooperation. Uh, I'm very glad that uh, uh, Nordic Welfare Center has worked a lot about how uh, a youth perspective can be str uh, stronger integrated into the Nordic cooperation on disability. And I think that that's a work that just needs to be constantly um, worked upon and improved upon because I think that's um, uh, because going to become more and more important as uh, the Nordic countries become more integrated. So that's uh, what I what I had to say. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much for a very enlightening and a very a very real conversation with us here. I, I was really happy to hear you amplify the issue around intersecting identities, and in this case, talking about youth and disability. Um, and that the different perspectives that youth bring are, are really important and often are the cutting edge issues that perhaps other people aren't thinking about. And here really we can take a leaf from climate change and see how it has been driven by, by youth. Um, and in the context of this discussion, mentioning the issue around sexual and reproductive health and how that's been driven by uh, youth is, is very, very important. So a lot there. Um, and I couldn't agree more with you that we need to have stronger umbrella organizations of persons with disabilities. In addition, they need to be able to integrate and have the youth voice more strongly present um, in those umbrellas. 
So now my task is not an easy one. It's to try and to, to come up with some concluding remarks. And I mean, it has been such a rich discussion that it's going to be very difficult for me to do that. But I will say a few words and then um, hand over back to the hosts to take some questions. And I think I'll start off by saying that I, we, I think you would all agree with me that over this time together in the webinar, we've covered an extensive body of work as it relates to children and youth with disabilities. We heard from Minister Blomkist that the, about the impact of the pandemic on children with disabilities. We also heard him reiterate a very strong commitment to ensure that all children are included and that all children participate. We then had an excellent overview from Professor Sandberg. And she talked about what participation means. What are the types of participation that are out there? She also spoke about some of the obligations that the state has to operationalize participation or the, or the right to participation. And I think one of the important points that I took away from her presentation was a stress point that she made around participation being on a continuum and that it is a continuous process. She drew strongly from the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, as well as from the Convention on the Rights of the Child, sharing with us some more recent concluding observations from the various Nordic countries. And in many ways, we sat, set a very um, strong stage for the discussions that then came after her. We then, we then heard from Merit, and that's why we had all come together today to launch the report. And so again, congratulations uh, to the Nordic Welfare Center on launching this report. But we heard from Merit um, about the report and really about some of the type, some of the methodologies that they used to, to, to um, populate the report. We heard about the importance of meaningful participation and generally the, the, the approach that they had taken to, to finalize the report. Then after that, we pivoted to uh, a series of shorter interventions that began to share with us some best practices or lessons learned. And in my mind, many of them are best practices. We, I'm, I'm sure you will all agree that the lesson learned from the Braille Lego bricks was extremely interesting. And I know that that uh, solicited a lot of comments in the chat box. And um, I think that many of those questions have been responded to. We had a talk on talk to children and had a short snippet of a simulation game. And this has whetted everybody's appetite to go back and learn more about that. So, so thank you very much for that. We heard about an important aspect around safer schools. And, safe, and schools being in many ways the central unit in which children participate. And how do we ensure that those places are safer for all children, including children with disabilities? And then we had an absolutely fascinating discussion from if you can see it, then you can support it. And then I think just lastly, Ivan's excellent presentation on voice, on voice of youth with disabilities and children with disabilities and ensuring that that voice is not just heard as many speakers have indicated, but really taken into account. And so in many ways that takes us from the language of the Convention on the Rights of the Child and the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities to the actual implementation of, of those rights. So for me, this has been a fascinating um, 
couple of hours. I have learned a tremendous amount myself. And with that, I will hand over to the hosts. I will hand over to Jessica, who will guide you all through the questions. And I will take my leave and thank you all very much. And hopefully the next time we get to do this event, I'm able to be with you in person. Thank you so much. A big thank you to, to you too, Charlotte. It has been an absolute pleasure to have you here. Uh, and a big thank you to all the presenters. We've had several comments in the chat that the presentations have been really interesting. And I would like to mention, for example, about the Snakkeme Barn website. Uh, one participant said, very interesting. I will definitely try it out. So that's good. Uh, then I will go to some questions before we will end this webinar, and I will start with you, Eivind. Uh, the question is, in which areas do you find it most difficult to be heard in Norway? Uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. I think it's um, it depends on uh, what kind of level you're talking about. If you're talking about the individual level, um, I think that uh, uh, often, uh, you know, it, it has to do with um, um, actually involving um, uh, youth with disabilities in their everyday life, such as school, for example. Um, where we see that uh, uh, not all uh, youth with disabilities are, um, you know, actually get to have a say, for example, in terms of what their education should be like. Um, and so, but I also think that that varies a lot from municipality to municipality. I think that there are a lot of places in Norway where that works well as well. So it really um when it comes when it goes down to an individual level i think it really uh is more person to person based because there are a lot of uh different access uh, to knowledge about people with disabilities in different parts of norway um if we talk about more on the systemic level in terms of uh, the way that organizations are listened to or are involved or not involved um i would say that that also well, I guess it's the same answer, actually. It's just more, uh, uh, are policymakers and decision makers actually interested in listen, to listen to what we have to say? Uh, and I think that that is also, it varies a lot. And, and uh, we see that uh, because we have a lot of uh, meetings with, uh, with uh, with uh, political leadership in different departments and ministries in Norway. And we see that when there's a new person coming in, that really impacts a lot whether or not uh, they're actually interested to have meetings with us and listen to us. So I think we need to kind of move on from, uh, find a way at least, it's not easy, but uh, so it's not so different from person to person, but it's more systematic involvement. This is a good thing to take with us from this webinar. Thank you, Eivind. And then we will move on to Siri Moravski. Um, this question is, what were the biggest challenges regarding organizing the safety walks? Uh, the biggest challenges, um, maybe to, to find schools, uh, actually, uh, to find schools willing uh, uh, to let us in and make uh, uh, make the walks, um, but it was not challenge. The, the schools themselves find the students, and that was what I, I, I think was pretty pretty easy. But when we, when we we, we had, it was a little bit tough finding schools. Um, do you have any tips? How did how did you find the schools? <laughs> <laughs> um, we often, because our contacts in municipalities are uh, um, other like desk officers working with this kind of um, these issues, uh, and we um, we use our contacts there in in different municipalities. 
uh, because we, we really wanted to have different municipalities. We, we didn't want to be in, in the Stockholm re region. Um, so we, we used those contacts and then on, could they um, contact different uh, schools in their area. Uh, and that worked well, very well. Thank you so much, Siri. And uh, lastly, we will move on to Cecilia Ekstrand. Uh, we have some practical questions about the Lego bricks. Uh, the first one is uh, up to which age would you say the Lego bricks can be used? I think up. Oh, now we can't I'm see I'm you. Sorry, <laughs> there you go. Up to um, around 14, 14 years, I think the different activities can be used up to 14. Uh, and then we have a specific question from Iceland. Will the bricks be available in Iceland? It depends on the language because uh, there are English um, uh, bricks and we have the Danish bricks and we have in Sweden the Sweden bricks. So if, if some of the children can use one of these languages, all right, thank you very much, Cecilia. And, and uh, once again, thank you to the participants in the chat. It has been really nice to, to get all the comments and questions. Uh, now I give over to you, Mariette, before we finish. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us today. Uh, it's been a pleasure to see so many attending today. And uh, we're so happy that uh, we have received a lot of questions. and. Uh, remarks during the day. Uh, we would like you to, to know that, uh, that um, the presentation material will be sent out to you after today and we will also send the links after the webinar. Uh, we also hope you please find the time to answer the evaluation of uh, the seminar that we'll, we will send out to everyone today. With this I will just uh, say Thank you for us and uh, we hope to see you again on another occasion.